So it's, it's pointless to try to design starships and things like that to get away from it. In other words, it's going to encompass the whole, the whole picture. <laughs> so well, I think <laughs> the Newtonian universe is some kind of a hallucination. <laughs> I mean, there are no... There, those are basically holes poked in black velvet. There are no distant stars. That's ridiculous. That whole thing is nonsense. The universe is a construct of mind of the human mind, essentially, and uh, it's now I, the agendas of the people who run this planet, it's clear we're not going anywhere. I mean, it would take us till 2012 to return to the moon if we made the decision today, and they're not making the decision today, they're quite making a very different kind the really thing is we know a lot less than we assume we know. I mean, if someone tells you that we live around a, a typical star at the edge of a typical galaxy strewn through a mega space trillions of times larger, I mean, they don't know what they're talking about. That's just the cheerful assurance of modern astronomy based on a bunch of fishy formulas that were cooked up uh, within the confines of the 20th century. I mean, it, the stars that shine down at night could be uh, painted dots on a scrim for all we know. I mean, I'm not saying that's the case, but what I am saying is uh, I think that the greatest disservice that science has done to humankind is the marginalizing of our own importance. If we even, let's take an objective measure uh, of, com uh, and uh, I think complexity, if you look around at nature, at the fossil record, at the human family, uh, complexity is clearly something very dear to nature. Nature preserves it, nature works through it, nature builds upon it. Well, uh, we're told we're a minor this in orbit around a minor that in a typical that and so forth and so on. But if you will look at the human cerebral cortex, what you discover is the most densely complexified matter known to exist in the universe. The human cerebral cortex contains more connections per cubic centimeter than any form of matter known to exist in this cosmos. If that's true, suddenly our marginality is completely obviated and it's clear that no, we are not marginal observers of a vast cosmic drama. We are uh, at the cutting edge of the development and conservation of complexity. And it is our mind which gives us these scenarios of our, of our position in space and time. It may well be that the human mind is very, very important. The human mind represents the culmination of biology, which is another phenomenon that these astrophysicists always love to marginalize and say, oh, well, biology, it's just going on on one planet as far as we know. It could be a fluke. It may have happened once and it'll never happen again. But, you know, the life of most stars is on the order of 500 million years. We happen to have the good fortune to be in orbit around a very slow burning stable star. And so we have ignored the fact that most stars last less than half a billion years. We can dig into the Gunflint chert of South Africa and bring up fossils of, of uh, soft bodied creatures that are close to three billion years old, six times the life of most stars in the universe. So when somebody's trying to tell you that what you, the universe is about is the life and death of stars, they're ignoring the fact that biology is a phenomenon as persistent as any phenomenon known to exist in the universe. And biology is not a static phenomenon. It isn't an endless recycling of of fissionable materials the way star life is, biological life has been steadily complexifying itself over the entire time span of its existence. So life is not marginal. Mind emerging out of life at its more complex levels of organization is not marginal. 
And we are not marginal. We are, I think, tremendously important in the cosmic drama and that a rational analysis of the situation will support that. Raise a whole bunch of interesting issues here. Look, this, look at how presumptuous science is. First of all, all of modern physics is based around the concept of constants. The central, and some of these are non-dimensional constants, but some are not, like the speed of light. Well, uh, the speed of light has been measured on this planet since 1906. Less than a hundred, uh, uh, just under a hundred years of measurement in a in a multi-billion year old universe carried out on one planet and from this you make the grand statement that the speed of light in all times and all places will obey this law of velocity give me a break it's it's just a, it's just a, a kind of a joke uh, and yet to admit that there is a problem here uh, would seriously undermine the premises of science things are worse than that. Throughout the 20th century, of course, the speed of light has been measured many, many times. Now, uh, the same value is rarely obtained. Okay. Now, the f f all of physics depends upon this being a universal constant. So when you point out to them that the same value is rarely obtained, they, s they wave their hands and say, ah, well, this has to do with the limits of the instrumentality, a term which will not be further defined. <laughs> this has to do with the limits of the instrumentality, and uh, we, they're just hitting around it, right? So at first, you, the uneducated layman, you think, well, that makes sense. I suppose they're just hitting around it. But then you go back and you look at these measurements of the speed of light, and you know what? They don't cluster around the point. Since 1906, successive measurements of the speed of light seem to imply that it's incrementally going slightly faster. The set of data points is drifting slightly across the thing. Well, now, how, if it's at the limits of the instrumentality, can you possibly explain that? Well, this became such an issue in the astrophysics community. And check this out that what they did is in 1972 they defined the speed of light <laughs> and they and they said this is the speed of light and all future calculations should use this number regardless of what the instruments are telling you a, a, a momentous turning point in the evolution of scientific thought at last nature itself is deemed no longer necessary for the study of nature and in fact it just gets in the way uh, anyway I can go on at great length about the foibles uh, uh. but what about origins the dominant and virtually unchallenged myth of our origin is either that God created us in seven days along with all the rest of creation or that the universe was born out of nothingness in a single moment for no reason. These are the two choices on the menu neither terribly compelling to rationalists, I dare say. Interesting to note that this scientific explanation, the universe sprang from nothing in a single instant, however we may think of it in terms of its veracity, notice that it's the limit case for credulity. <laughs> you understand what I mean? I, I mean that if you can believe that, hell, you can believe anything. <laughs> Sit down and try and think of something more improbable than that contention.
So it's like they open up with the one-two punch and say, you know, put that in front of them. If they can swallow that, then, you know, the hydrogen bond, gene segregation and whatever will follow hard pace because the hard swallow comes first. Well, now I... I um, <laughs> I maintain that it's a very odd place to look for what that's called is a singularity and many theories require a singularity that means in order to kick start the intellectual engine you have to go outside the system and you get one free hypothesis <laughs> and then once you've used that up your system has to run very very smoothly clear down to the end so science uses up its one free hypothesis with the big bang and it says you know give me the first 10 high 12 10 to the minus high 12 nanoseconds and if I can do smoke and mirrors in that then the rest will proceed quite in an orderly fashion if that now that's orthodoxy you got to understand you know that's what the straight people believe so I think that uh if you get one free singularity in your model building, a more likely place to put it would be not in a featureless, dimensionless, processless vacuum, super vacuum, it isn't even a vacuum, uh, at the beginning, but why not look toward the domain of many temperature regimes, many forms of energy, many languages, many chemical systems, many different levels of uh, energy exchange. In other words, why not look for the singularity late in the life of the universe instead of in the immediate moments of its birth? Uh, then what you have is a picture not of a process being pushed by causality toward some heat death billions of years in the future but what you get is a picture of a universe that is flowing naturally toward a dwell point or a low point in the energy landscape that's at the end that uh, organization transcends itself produces more complex organization which transcends itself which produces more complex organization and conceivably out of a process of avalanching complexity like that you might actually get a singularity of some sort and uh, this singularity would have the character of an attractor now I grant you that it's irrational but our little discussion of the birth of the universe should convince you that it's all irrational that isn't that doesn't get you tossed out of the game that's the name of the game <laughs> so being hopefully a sane person my own inner dialogue uh, goes back and forth between the desire to preserve rationality and hence channel energy toward utopian hope which is reasonable after all we have the money the scientific knowledge the uh, communication systems and so forth to solve any of our problems feeding the hungry, curing disease, halting the destruction of the environment. The problem is our minds, that we cannot change our minds as quickly as we can redesign harbors, flatten mountains, cut rainforests, dam rivers. These things pose no problem. Changing our minds is very difficult. And because I see that, and because I see it from a psychedelic point of view, and because I don't want to abandon myself to despair, instead I see then this transcendental object at the end of time. This is not part of the utopian schema. This is part of the millenarian 
uh, revelation. But uh, it's a very persistent idea in all times and all places. This highly unlikely concept has been kept alive. And I don't, I think that we are blinding ourselves to the intentionality present in our world. I think you have to have, be carrying a lot of unusual intellectual baggage to not see the last thousand years as a moving toward a